Welcome to our service for today, Sunday, the 24th of November, whether you are joining with us in the building or with us online. You are most welcome. A special welcome to anybody who's visiting, however you are doing that today. Just one or two things to highlight in church life. Next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. That means that between now and then, we need to do some Christmas decorating in the church. So if you are free Thursday evening, 6.30 p.m. onwards, please do come down here and help us stick up the decorations and the Christmas trees in different parts of the building. That's Thursday at 6.30. The more, the merrier. Also, this coming Saturday, we have our St. Andrew's Day Cayley, 7 p.m. in the building. If you would like to perform something as part of the Cayley, Ken would love to hear from you. He's sitting over there in the corner, so please see Ken between now and next Saturday. But do come along for a good evening of entertainment and fellowship together. And next Sunday, first Sunday in Advent, we also have a baptismal service. Um, so there are a couple of people being baptized next Sunday morning as part of our service. So please do make every effort to be there and join with us in this time of celebration. Today, we are concluding our sermon series in some of the tough situations that we find ourselves in life and the friendship of Jesus during them. Muriel's going to be preaching today on the topic of grief and loss. Um, which you will do later on in the service. But as we gather, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, preaching good tidings to the people, proclaiming release to captives, setting at liberty those who are bound, we adore you. Lord Jesus, friend of the outcast and the poor, feeder of the hungry, healer of the sick, we adore you. Lord Jesus, denouncing the oppressor, exposing the hypocrite, overcoming evil with good, we adore you. Lord Jesus, pattern of gentleness, teacher of holiness, prophet of the kingdom, we adore you. Lord Jesus, dying to save us from our sin, rising to give us eternal life, ascending to prepare our heavenly home, we adore you. Amen. Let's rise if we're able and we're going to sing our opening hymn. It's one that's based on a tune from the Scottish Psalter. It's one that I always associate with grief and loss, particularly in the northeast of Scotland, as it's a funeral favourite. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Based on the 23rd Psalm. Let's rise if we're able and sing God's praise. <laughs>
I don't know what you think of when you look at some really old portrait photographs and pictures of people. I, I often look at them, and all I can see is staring back at me some stern, perhaps even unapproachable person pictured in the photographs. I thought we could have a little bit of fun this morning, and I'm going to show you some photographs of previous ministers of Crown Terrace Baptist Church and see if you agree with me or not as to whether you think they look stern or not. So let's start with the first picture. This is G.S. Mee, who was the minister of the church, well, about 175 years ago. Do you think he looks stern, a formidable type person? Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. How about the next one then? Clarence Chambers. He was the minister here just over about 150 years ago. Very wise, but yeah, I think it might be the specs. I'm not sure. It makes his eyes look a little bit beady. Next one then. Let's try Alexander Anderson, who followed Clarence Chambers. Wow. What do you think? Stern? Uh, uh, I've, there are probably some worse ones out there, but again, I'm not too sure. And then the last one then, this is Forbes Jackson, who was the minister here just over a hundred years ago. Yeah, it's an interesting hairstyle as well. I look at these pictures, and I, 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 I think, I mean, Alexander Anderson, I'm, yeah, he looks particularly stern to me. This is perhaps why we don't take portrait photographs of the ministers anymore probably safe on everybody's account. Here's a, another picture. He was not a minister of Crown Terrace Baptist, but his name is Frank Greff, and he lived um, about 150-odd years ago. He was a Methodist minister. I think he looks a little bit stern in that picture. I think it might be the moustache that's probably emphasizing that fact, but... In reality, Frank was not a stern person. He was, by all accounts, a very cheerful person. Among his friends and fellow ministers, he was known as the Sunshine Minister. Now, there's a title. One of his friends described him this way. He's a spiritual optimist, a great friend of children. His bright, sunshining disposition attracts him not only to children, but to all with whom he comes in contact. The sunshine minister, a cheery person. But despite this cheerful attitude, the Reverend Greff faced some difficult times in his life. The deep valleys that the psalmist talks about in Psalm 23 were a reality for him. It was during one of these valley time experiences that he asked himself the question, does Jesus care? He struggled with that question. And as he struggled with that question, he wrote the hymn called, Does Jesus Care? It's found in some of our very ancient hymn books, not interestingly in any of the modern ones. But the chorus of the hymn answers the question, does Jesus care like this? Oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary, the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care? about the things that we are facing in our daily life? Does he care when we are sick? Does he care when we are hurting? Does he care when we are experiencing grief and loss? These are the kind of questions that we may ask when we are experiencing these difficult times in our lives, these valley experiences. And the reality is that Jesus does care. He cares for you and he cares for me. And it's important for us to remember that, that Jesus cares about every part of our lives, no matter how big or how small. 
He cares about our work, our hobbies, the things that we enjoy doing. He wants us to be happy and to enjoy the things that we enjoy in life but He's also with us and cares for us in the dark times, in the valleys, in our grief and our loss that Muriel will help us focus on later in the service. So when we're feeling sad, lonely, remember that Jesus cares. Remember the words of that chorus, that He's always there to help us, to comfort us in the valleys as well as the highs of life. Let's pause and pray. Father, we thank you for our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. We're thankful that no matter what difficulties we face in life, we can say with confidence, oh yes, He cares. I know He cares. Help us to remember that Jesus cares about every part of our lives and to share His love with others. We ask this in His name. Amen. The creche kids can head out down the back for their fun with their leaders. The rest of us are going to continue to praise God together in a couple of songs. The first reminds us that we are in God's hands along with the whole world. And the second reminds us of His everlasting kindness that He's lavished upon us. If we're able, when the music starts, please rise so we can praise God together.
reading today comes from Isaiah chapter 61, which can be found on page 748 of the Church Bibles. We're going to read the opening verses of this chapter, which speaks about the year of the Lord's favor. Isaiah chapter 61, starting at verse 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Amen. The Word of God for the people of God. Muriel's going to come now and share with us. Good morning. Good morning. Is that okay? You'll sort me out good. <laughs> well, as Gary has said, we come today to the end of just a very mini series on the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And today, I think we're looking at one of the toughest subjects of all, grief and loss. Not an easy one. I wonder why on earth I got myself into this all week. But it's something we have to look at because, oh, we're booming again. We will all experience it. And many of us have already experienced it. And we want to know what the Bible teaches us about it and how, as Christians, we mourn differently. Loss is a universal experience, but there are all sorts of different losses, different intensities. And a lot of losses lead to gain. You leave one job to go to another. There's the loss of that job. But there's the gain of going into something new. When we moved house about 10, 11 years ago, yeah, we lost our old house and we lost the patterns that had been established around that. But there was the gain of going somewhere new and developing new patterns and getting into a new way of life. But what we're thinking about today is not the loss that leads to gain. It's the kind of loss where there's no immediate gain, simply sadness, feeling bereft, feeling that life can never be the same again. It's the kind of sadness that Wordsworth expresses in one of his poems. Wordsworth wrote a lot of poems, and I'm sure some of you remember your school days when you had to learn them. This, this is one of, to me, one of the most profound and emotional ones he ever wrote. And it's very, very simple. It's, a, it's called Lucy, I think. She dwelt among untrodden ways beside the springs of Dove, a maid whom there were none to praise and very few to love, a violet by a mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. Listen to this verse. She lived unknown, and few could know when Lucy ceased to be. But she is in her grave, and oh, the difference to me. And in those two lines, there is so much emotion expressed, very simple words, 
And that's the kind of loss that we're looking at today. I know this is a difficult subject, and I know it will press buttons for quite a lot of you. So please, as we go through for coffee today, be aware of that. Be gentle with each other. So what does it mean when, the, when we're singing about this, what a friend we have in Jesus, that he is with us in times of grief and loss? What help is there in the Bible for us? In Ecclesiastes, which I'm sure you all know this very well, there is a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. Weeping and grieving have their place in our lives. There are some schools of thought that would have us forever in a high and try to make us feel guilty if we're not rejoicing in our sorrow. It worries me quite a lot that there's a trend now in funerals to have great celebrations and all sorts of fancy things going on and not leaving enough time for mourning and sadness because they have their place and they necessarily have their place. But the Bible tells us that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning and we must always keep that before us. Paul wrote, brothers, we don't want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Paul was writing to a small island of Christians at that point, living in a sea of paganism, all sorts of beliefs going around. Perhaps these were some of his earliest writings. It's in the book of Thessalonians. But he was trying to teach his fellow Christians about the fundamentals of the Christian faith. And one of the most fundamental things they needed to learn was to grieve as Christians rather than as pagans or Jews. They were to grieve, yes, but not like the rest of men who have no hope. There's all sorts of things that we could learn about that, about how they, they believed that after the resurrection, those who had already died were dead. There was no hope for them. Paul was trying to tell them something else. He is assuring them that those who have already fallen asleep, I use, that's just a euphemism for death, we've got lots of them, will surely be brought with Jesus when he returns. So today, that means we can grieve. Like everyone else in the world, when our loved ones die, when we lose someone, but we grieve as people with hope, as people who believe in everlasting life, who believe that death is not the end of life, but the entrance into a new life with Christ and the community of saints. Our grief is deep and sorrowful and difficult. It always is, but it is not without hope. It is not without hope. Our hope lies in the resurrection of Christ. We're going to have a little light-hearted interlude here because it is a heavy subject. Forgive me, I don't mean to be frivolous with this, but it's quite... When, when, we, when we grieve, we go through a process and the same process is true of all kinds of loss, no matter what they are. Different in intensity, but nevertheless true. So, let's go through losing your first tooth. Anticipation. You know it's going to happen. I'm not sure if when, but it's wobbly. It's going to happen. And you're tongue, always giving it a poke to see if it's still there. Then the event. Tooth comes out. Maybe it's very painful, but it's gone. Then the ritual. Now, I apologize to those of you who are not from our country. 
there's a very important ritual attached to the loss of a tooth. And that's all about someone called the Tooth Fairy. And if you want to know about the Tooth Fairy, please do ask someone when you're having your coffee. But you put your tooth under the pillow, the Tooth Fairy comes in the night, takes away the tooth and leaves something. That's not important. What's important is that a ritual follows the loss. Then there's that disbelief. It can't really be gone. And you keep poking the space where it used to be. But it is gone. Then you learn to live with it. It becomes just normal to have that gap. And then there is new growth. And you get a new tooth. And that process, actually, though that's a very simple illustration, that's one of the processes that we do go through in all sorts of loss. There's lots of things that have been written about stages of grief. And I think one of the most important things to know is that it's normal. It's normal to go through all these stages. And mourning is the work of grief. It's what we do with our feelings. Anger, that's one of them. We can express it in all sorts of ways, often to the wrong person. My husband always remembers he was a telegraph boy just at the end of the war. And he remembers delivering a telegram to a lady giving her the news that her husband had been killed. And what a railing he got from that woman. She expressed all her anger to this 16-year-old boy who didn't have a clue what to do with it. But anger is an energy. And it can be used in positive ways as well. And often you see when someone has died or something, somebody campaigning for something or setting up trust and doing something with the anger they have. But the anger is absolutely normal. And we read about it in the Psalms all the time. This is a, a more modern um, version of a Psalm. Get up, God, and you're going to sleep all day. Wake up. Don't you care what happens to us? Why do you bury your face in a pillow? Why pretend things are just fine with us? Here we are, flat on our faces in the dirt, held down with a boot in our necks. Get up and come to our rescue if you love us so much. Help us. These are very angry words, but they are left in the Bible for us to read. There are other ways to express anger other than words. As I've said, there's campaigning and all sorts of things. Physical labor. Then there are the if-onlys. The regrets which can eat away at us. And I think that the most profound example of that in the Bible is the anguished words of David on hearing on the de of the death of Absalom. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And I'm sure some of us can identify with that. People grieve in different ways. Let's look at Mary and Martha. Now, I know we've touched on Mary and Martha before, but, you know, when Lazarus dies, their personalities show in the different ways that they grieve. It's interesting, in John's Gospel, the story of Mary and Martha, they, Mary and Martha both use the same words. If only you had been here, my brother would not have died. What we can't see on the printed page is the tone of voice they use. Martha is using her thinking, her faith, what she's been taught. Mary, we get the feeling, surmise, is simply overwhelmed by her feelings. We all grieve in very different ways. Don't make assumptions about how people are grieving. People sometimes need to talk. People sometimes need to be silent. People sometimes need company. People sometimes need to be left alone. But Jesus, 
addressed both these sisters. He addressed Martha's mind. That's what she needed. That's what Jesus gave her. But for Mary, using the same words as her sister, Jesus wept. He had compassion and care for her. But he treated them both as they needed to be treated. The journey of grief is not a straight path. It goes into all sorts of bends and twists, and you can think you're back at the beginning when, in fact, you have actually moved on a bit. We don't get over losses. They become part of us, and we grow through them. But we need to help each other along that journey. So how? How does it happen? How do we grieve differently with the hopes that we have? I'm going to use a passage in the Old Testament, and I say, I kind of apologize immediately for this, because the first words of this little passage is in Haggai chapter 2, are, be strong. Now, these are the last words I would ever, ever say to somebody who was mourning be strong. No, absolutely not. But what is said after that is, be strong for the Lord your God is with you. The Lord your God is with you. If we take ourselves back to these people, they were rebuilding the temple. They were tired, they were weary. It was a huge task. They'd been working for about a month and all the initial enthusiasm they had had gone, died down, and they were now faced with a sheer slog of hard work. Tiredness, weariness, physical pain. And along comes the prophet and says, be strong. Not only once, but three times just to make sure they got the message. But they would have recognized those words. They were said to Joshua when Moses died, and he was given the task of leading the people into the promised land. They were said to Solomon by David when he was encouraged to build the temple. So when they come to the people, there's a familiar ring to them. They are not empty or shallow because of what follows them. The Lord your God is with you. God doesn't ever say to us, be strong or do not be afraid or don't be anxious without also saying, I am with you. What a friend we have in Jesus. And that's what transforms the words. There are places where God will not let us go alone. I'm sure you can think in your own life of places where you haven't wanted to go alone or where you haven't wanted members of your family to go alone. When my wee boy was only five, he had to have his teeth out. I wouldn't have let him go to the dentist on his own. But when he was 20, he still wanted his mum to go to the dentist with him to get his teeth out. Perhaps there are journeys you can remember, sad journeys. Journeys perhaps to see someone who you've known well and loved well, and they've been very ill, and you haven't wanted to go alone on that journey. It helps to have someone with us at times like that. Perhaps going to get the results of tests or x-rays, or just coming into hospital. What sort of person would you want at a time like that? You'd want someone who knew you really well, someone who understands you, someone who knew when to be quiet and when to talk, someone you felt comfortable with, 
The Bible tells us that that's how well God knows us. He knows how we're feeling. We don't have to explain it all to him. He knows our thoughts, not only our thoughts, but why we think them. He knows our standing up and our sitting down, our coming or going. Our names are written on the palm of his hand. On a journey like this, you'd want someone who would stick with you, who wouldn't let you down at the last minute. We all know that heart-sinking feeling when someone we've been depending on lets us down. Can't come at the last minute. How rejected we can feel. Someone who promised to visit doesn't come. Or says sometimes, have a coffee sometime, but it never happens. We don't want someone like that on a painful journey into difficult places. Someone we can depend on, a faithful God. And on that kind of journey, we want someone who can be strong not someone we have to support who will get the jitters or be upset, need our help. We need someone who is strong and to, can give us support and help. Who else but Almighty God, the one whose strength is made perfect in our weakness. What a friend we have in Jesus. And throughout the Bible, we have a history of weak characters being made strong by a powerful God who journeys with them. Think of David. Think of Moses. Think of the boy Samuel. Think of people like Gladys Aylward. I had the great privilege, and I don't know if anybody else here had that, of actually hearing Gladys Aylward preach in Holborn West Church when I was a teenager. That was an amazing experience. And if any of you have never heard of her or don't know her story, it's worth a read. A little parliament who went to China and achieved great things for God. If you don't like reading, what's the end of the sixth happiness, that's the name of the film. And it's on YouTube or something. Lots of places that God will not let us go alone. But... It's all very well saying that. I had a conversation this week with someone who has been through the most horrendous journey of grief and sadness and loss of all kinds. And she'd spoken to her minister and her minister had said, but God is with you. And she said to me, but how? How is God with me? How do I know? Now, for some people, they do feel that kind of ethereal presence of God, and that's great. She wasn't feeling that. But we gradually unpicked her story. And as we unpicked it, we saw the times when different people had been there for her, had helped her on her journey. And I said to her, that that was God being with you. And that is the challenge for us. We are the people of God. We are communities of compassion. We are the hands and feet and presence of Jesus. We are the ones, we are the friends who have to travel alongside those who are going through difficult, difficult journeys, who have to be the quiet presence, the trustworthy, reliable presence, the strong presence. We are the ones who have to share the love and presence of God. And then when we become the grievers, the ones who are losing. We have to accept, not always easy, 
accept the help from others and allow them the privilege of bringing God's presence to us. That's a big challenge for us, but it's an important challenge. Communities of compassion. Is Crown Terrace a community of compassion? I would like to think it is. Let's pray together. God our Father, it is so hard for us to face grief and loss. We want to avoid it, to run away from it, deny it, act as if everything's normal. We pray that you would enable us to find a place for loss in our lives and some purpose in it. And may there be in our hearts always a place where we anticipate resurrection. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will go gently today among those who mourn, especially if death has been sudden, cruel, undeserved, and also those whose painful memories have been stirred. Use our prayers and the companionship of God's people not to provide glib answers to the mystery of death. But to let those who weep know that they do not weep alone. Let those who are bewildered have the chance to express their confusion. And let those who have no faith lean on someone who has. In all of this, Remind us that we are called to be the hands, the feet, the presence of Jesus. Give us the grace to fulfill this commission. Let's join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer, in whatever language is comfortable for you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Assist thee our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. I love my grandpa dearly and he died probably about 50 years ago but I loved him and his very favourite song was Scarlet Ribbons fortunately what a friend we have in Jesus goes very well to that tune so we're going to sing that now